Hey, uh, we've been in a series for the last few months called Faith It. Uh, we stepped into this semester just believing that God uh, wanted to do some big things and God wanted to, to show up in ways that we expected him to, yeah? And so we, we said, man, there are times where we wanted to walk away from it. There are times where we wanted to, to quit it. But this was the semester where we were going to say we're going to faith it all the way through. We were just going to put faith to work. And man, what we have seen is God move in ways that we actually prayed for. You know that? Like, so we, we actually didn't just wait back and say, man, God, we want you to move. We said, God, would you move in this way? And we've seen God do that. We have students that are going to get baptized later on in the service, and we prayed for that at the beginning of the semester. We prayed that Jesus would capture people's hearts in a way that they would be ready to proclaim their faith. And he's doing that right now. And then we pray for miracles. We pray for financial breakthroughs. We pray for restored relationships. And we have seen all of that and then more. Why? Because we didn't give up on it, we didn't quit on it, instead we just said we're going to see faith all the way through it, yeah? This semester we've talked um, about two different faiths so far. We talked about um, the beginning is, is moving faith, that God uh, wants to move you from here to there, but it takes faith for that to happen. We talked about needy faith, that, that it's okay to be needy because God wants us to ask. And so we talked about all these different types of faith, and so tonight I just want to move along the journey, and I want to talk about another faith, but I want to call it crazy faith. When's the last time you saw God do something so crazy in your life, but it was attached to such a crazy amount of faith? There's times where I believe that oftentimes we miss out on the craziest opportunities because we don't walk in the crazy amount of faith that God asks us to. There's two types of faith that I see in the text. It's faith that amazes Jesus, and it's faith that amazes Jesus. One is because there's a lot of it, and one of it is because it's a little. And I just believe that we as people, God is calling us to actually walk in a crazy amount of faith. So tonight, I just want to look at a story that I believe is uh, a picture of what it actually looks like to be a crazy type of person with faith. I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 33. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, and after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking in the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out the boat and he walked on water and he came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. I'm a music guy. Uh, how many people are like, y'all like really into music? How many of you are like the type of music people that you like, care about a song because of the lyrics? How many of you are like, you care about the song because of the beat? How many of you like, you care about the song because of the way that makes you feel? That's me too. I'm a feeling type of person. Uh, you could have a great song with great lyrics and a great beat, but if it doesn't make me feel good, I don't really care about it. 2019, I listened to the, uh, uh, this album that I listened to it all the way through, all year long, simply because I like the way that it made me feel. There's young people in the room now. There's some times where you listen to songs, and it manipulates you into a type of feeling, right? So they say, like, there's breakup songs. Don't listen to them if you just went through a breakup, because it just makes you feel deeper in that thing, yeah? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, some of you old people are like, I've been there, done that. Like, and I'm not a country guy, but I'm looking at some of y'all, y'all like, yeah, that, I know. <laughs> we all like music, yeah? We all have a different way in which we relate and connect to music. I'm a music guy. I love music. A few months ago, I was with one of my best friends and his fiance at the time, and we're sitting, I'm in the back seat, and they're talking about what song they're gonna play for the first dance. And she's going down the list, and she's like, just listen to the lyrics. And he's like, I don't care about the lyrics. I care about how it makes me feel. And so she's playing these songs, and they were like bad songs, but you're like, not a first dance song, y'all. And me and Fraser are looking at each other like, I know, bro, because we think alike. We think alike. And so, excuse me. 
And so I'm with Frazier and I'm like, bro, let's think about this song. And he's like, yeah, let's pick it. So they end up having their moment, right? I'm about to be married when we're 22, 21 days. 20 days out. Come on, y'all. That's crazy. Right? 20 days. And the other, last week we were, we were traveling, and so we're like working on our list, right? And so it's the same kind of thing. It's like, what song do you want to hear? Like, what song should we come out to? What song should our families walk out to? And so we finally finalize all of our songs, and I have this playlist now. And I've been listening to the playlist for the last seven days. It's three songs that I just play the whole entire time that I get in the car. So much that little man over here, he knows exactly. I start singing Wonderful God, and he's like, Wonderful God, in the back seat. He knows exactly. He hasn't even heard the whole entire song. That song, that album, that playlist, it does something to me. I'm prepared to get married emotionally, and it's three yeah, days out so, because I've just been paying attention to the song so much. I connect with songs through how they make me feel, sometimes through lyrics, sometimes through the beat. There's this song that I was listening to. It's one of those times where you're like, okay, this is like a vibe. Like, okay, like I, this is a vibe. And then you're like, the lyrics though. Let's talk about it really quick. And so I, what I was going to do is I was going to sing for you, but I know better than that. So John is actually, we're actually going to play it in the back. And I just want you to take just a few moments to listen to it. However you connect with the song, you connect. Whether it's the beat, it's the lyrics, or it's how it makes you feel. And we'll come back, yeah? And I get it. So I'm listening to this song, and I'm like, yeah, it's a vibe. You know, like I'm vibing with it, and it's cool. And then I'm like, ooh, I like the lyrics. This is how you walk, how you walk on water. <laughs> Look, where's Terrell? <laughs> He's, like, that. He's like, that's my iPad, bro. It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> but I'm listening uh, to this song and you know like I'm dancing and I'm feeling good and then I start listening to the lyrics start listening to the lyrics and it's like this is how you walk how you walk on water one foot in front of the other and you're like that's not true <laughs> that's not when's the last time you walked on water <laughs> look have you ever tried if you did you foolish because it's not like one step after the other, this is how you walk, this is, that's not true. Yet the song did this thing to me. It made me feel like I could walk on water. Isn't it funny how songs will do that? They make you feel something that is not reality and is not possible. This song, this is how you walk, how you walk on water, one foot in front of the other, created a feeling of made me believe I could do it. <laughs> I didn't try. <laughs> You shouldn't. If you do, let me know how it goes. But it's teaching us something. This is how you walk, how you walk on water, one foot in front of the other. And I believe that this story of, of Jesus and Peter walking on water is actually a picture. And it's, let me say it like this, that it can't be a story just for story's sake because it's in the text. That Matthew, the writer, has, was inspired to write it for what reason? Not just any reason, but for a real reason. A reason that I believe God is actually trying to give us a picture of what it looks like to walk on with Jesus. See, I feel like we oftentimes in the church talk about the solid ground. What about the shaky ground? What about the uncertain ground? What about the ground that does not feel like a solid place to stand on, but it actually feels like a shaky place to stand on? It feels something like water. But that song is like, this is how you walk, how you walk on Water. I know how to walk on land. I ain't never walked on water, though. But I feel like Jesus is actually creating this moment to show us that following Jesus will sometimes feel like you're walking on solid ground. And other times, it's going to feel like you're walking on uncertain, shaky, and insecure ground. How many of you have felt that in your life? That you felt like at one point it was confident and you were like, it's hard. And other times you're like, is it even there? I want to look at this text because I believe that Jesus truly, truly is trying to show us something about what it looks like to actually follow him. And I want to just start really, really quickly with my first point, which is you got to get out of the boat if you're going to walk on water. You have to get out of the boat if you're going to walk on water. And, and what we know about the story is that 
They, are, they have, um, Jesus had just produced a miracle and he has sent the disciples on to the other side of the lake, the Lake of Galilee. And so they are on this journey. And as they are in the middle of this journey, they are hit with uh, waves and, and wind. And it is something kind of like a storm, but this is a lake. So it's not like a, a ocean where you got like huge waves that the wind was such a strong wind that it had produced a lot of movement on the water. And Jesus is, is calling them to go to the other side. And in the middle of this, Jesus shows up and he says that Jesus walking on water, it says that Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on water. What's true is that Peter was in the the, the boat, but so were the rest of the disciples. And so as Peter decides to take the faith and the step of faith to get out of the boat, I want us to ask the question, why did the rest of the disciples stay in the boat? I preached this message actually a month ago, and I really hit on why we need to get out of the boat. But I want to spend a little bit of more time addressing the disciples and why they chose to stay in the boat. Because I think there oftentimes is actually where we in our lives actually exist more. That we are encouraged and challenged to step out of the boat, but oftentimes we live our lives staying stuck in the boat. And so inside of the boat, you have to ask yourself a few questions. Is Peter crazy for getting out of the boat and deciding to walk on water? Or are the disciples crazy for staying in a boat, beaten up by the waves? So this isn't like a normal boat. This boat is about 27 feet long, and it's about seven and a half feet feet wide, but it's only four and a half feet deep. It's not like a, it's not a secure boat, right? It's not a boat that I'm like, yeah, 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 this is safe. Yet something about the two is very, very different. You see, this boat could have held about 15 people, but what the text tells us is that the boat had already took a bunch of L's. It says that they are in the middle of this storm, and it says that the wind was against them, and it says that they were beaten up by the waves. Have you ever been hit with water that it feels like a punch? (laughs) That's what the boat is going through. The boat is literally getting beat up, beat up. Now, I grew up not a fighter, but I grew up uh, and just letting you into a little bit of my journey, uh, my parents said, hey, as long as you don't throw the first punch, you're good. But if you keep getting beat up and you're not throwing punches, that's on you. So in the moments that I, you know, before I loved Jesus, of course, <laughs> times where I maybe have gotten in a fight or two or three or four, I, there was not one time where I got hit and I didn't throw a fight, a punch back. Now I want you to keep this in mind. You got, in one side of the ring, you got the boat. And on the other side of the ring, you got the water. And guess who is just, round one, the water knocks out the boat. That's the situation. The boat is not winning. The boat is losing, which means the people in the boat are not really that secure. Peter decides to step out of the boat But a group of people, the majority of the disciples, decide to stay in the boat. We have to ask the question, why is it that they feel that the boat is more safe to stay in than to get out? I feel like this oftentimes is actually how we live our lives, beaten up, tired, exhausted, worn out, getting ready to tip over, really, really shaky, yet we think that staying in the boat is actually the safest thing that we can do. When the reality is, they're not, he's not just getting out the boat to get out the boat. It says that he got out the boat and he began to walk towards Jesus. Why is it that we decide to stay in our boats that keep getting beat up by waves instead of get out the boat that gets to where you start walking towards Jesus? Jesus is not taking an L by the wave. He's standing on the wave. The boat is floating on the wave, but it's getting beat up by the water. I feel like there's something that's really big Uh, when we talk about the the illusion of what's safe and what is not safe. The disciples thought that the boat was safe, and Peter had enough faith to know that the boat actually wasn't the safest thing for him to do. And so you ask ourselves, why stay in the boat? And I got to thinking about this, and I thought, man, the boat probably was security to them. The boat was probably a safe place for them. You see, what you find security in you will put confidence in. What you find security in, you'll put confidence in. 
Some of you have been finding security in people, so you put your confidence in people. Some of you find your securities in your success, your story, where you come from, and so you put confidence in that, but not where you're going. Because your confidence is what you think is the most secure. And so oftentimes we find confidence in the thing that we think is the most secure. Or if it seems like it's giving us a picture of security and it's like, oh, this thing can take care of you, you're like, oh, let me put confidence in it. Let me put all of myself into it. Here's what I want to even take a little bit further, that what you find security in, you'll put your confidence in. But the only reason why you put confidence in it is because you're the one that can control it. The boat is nothing without a driver. If that's the case, then it's just this thing that's floating on water. So it makes sense to me that the disciples would rather stay in the boat than get out of it because they don't have control of walking on water, but they do have control in in, in driving the boat. You see, and what you find your security in, you put confidence in. But if we're just being honest, the only reason why you feel confident is because you can put your hands on it which is why you won't step out in your future because you don't know your future. You won't step out into the thing that God's calling you because you don't know how it works out. So you stay stuck in your boat because you have the most security because you're in the most control there. So the first step to walking on water and being somebody that walks on water is to get out of your boat. It's to actually release control, not to try to regain control by waves that are beating you up. You're taking L's right now in your life, yet you're still trying to gain control. What would your life look like if you begin to release control and start walking to something that's more secure than a boat itself? Jesus is standing on water, not taking any L's by the water. Yet the boat is getting beat up by the water and the disciples find themselves saying, I'm the most secure staying in the boat. All of them stay in and one of them gets out. The first step to you walking on water is you have to get out of your boat. You must get out of your boat. If we're going to be people who walk on water, we have to get out of our boat. And I love this because there's some re, uh, such a relatability to this, this story, but there's also such a, um, this story doesn't make sense because you wouldn't get out of your boat. <laughs> In real life, we go to Lake Nag right now, would you get out the boat? No. You wouldn't get out. And I would look at you crazy if you got out. If you were like, I'm about to walk on water, I'd be like, you a fool. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> Go ahead. Watch you sink. The disciples probably were looking at Peter like he was absolutely crazy. But I wonder if Peter was looking at him as like, but we could have been walking towards Jesus, yet you stayed in the boat. So who's really the crazy one? So much of your life, we either look like you're crazy for doing one thing, <laughs> or you're looking at people for crazy for staying in the same thing. The disciples stayed in the boat. And Peter is our example of what it looks like to get out of the boat. So I wanna talk about that because we we understand why they stayed in it, but we have to really talk about why Peter decided to get out of it. So my second point is this. If we're gonna get out of our boat, we're gonna begin to walk on water, We have to learn how to hold on to the word in the wind. We have to learn how to hold on to the word in the wind. Look at the story. Look at the story. Let's play it out a little bit. Being up by the waves, the disciples saw him, they're walking out. It's a ghost. Immediately, Jesus says, take heart. Peter answers him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come. And he says, come. And Peter's like, I'm out of the boat. I'm walking in water and begins to come to Jesus. So the disciples stay in the boat because they find the most security and they find the most control, so they're confident there. Yet Peter has a revelation that if he gets out the boat, he's walking towards Jesus. Like I said before, if I were to take you to Lake Nack and tell you to get out of the boat, and you get out of the boat, unfortunately, you're crazy. Can I just say that? You're crazy. You're crazy if you think that you can walk on water. But Peter walks on water. So it can't just be a story of an idea of you walking on water. It has to be a story because Jesus called him to walk on water and he got out and he began to walk. 
So this is a story that has to mean something to the way that we live our lives. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on water. At this point, I am going to pull back into reality. Like I said, I'm, if you do that, I'm calling you crazy. I'm going to put myself as if I was one of the disciples in the boat. Jesus, if it is you, come. Come. And I watch you get out the boat. <laughs> I'm, at this point, I'm looking at Peter like, my guy is reckless. My guy does not value his life. My guy is crazy. He's psycho if he really thinks he's about to go. And there's two reasons why I'm saying what I'm saying. Because the first reason is he's walking on water. That's the first reason why he has to be crazy, is he's actually walking on water. Now, if you saw somebody walk on water, would you think that they were regular or they were like out of this world, out of this world? If I saw you walking on water, I'd be like, you've been talking to some, some, some of the wrong people and you've been doing the wrong magic and you've been spending the, the, I don't know what your prayers are. I don't know who you're praying to, but I ain't never seen that, right? So it's like, I'm looking at you in one way. I'm like, oh, I'm a, like, how is this possible? You know? There's another side of me that might want to think that I'm looking at it in a different way. I'm like absolutely astonished by it. And I'm like, yo, pull out your phone. Do y'all see this? Like this has to go on the gram. We need to make a TikTok. We're about to go viral for this thing because we ain't never seen nobody do this. So we're like, I'm mad excited. So Peter is either crazy for crazy or he's just doing something that I would just say is really, really reckless. So that makes me think about my second reason why I think crazy, why Peter is careless and crazy. Verse 26 says, but when the disciples saw him walking on the water, on the sea, it says that they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. He already crazy for walking on water. Let's add this other thing is that he's crazy for walking on water towards a ghost. He's not walking towards what he knows is Jesus. He's walking towards what they think is a ghost. Wouldn't you think I was crazy if I was walking on water and headed to something that I cannot see, but I heard somebody tell me that I was supposed to come? Now, how many of you like scary movies? Like, people are like, no. There's like a few people. If you're like a scary movie, like, hey, be confident that, that you like scary movies. If you like scary movies, raise your hand. All right. Now, to the people who like scary movies, you know those uh, movies, they're typically like teenage, high school, they're young, maybe some college people, and they like go to a cabin. And, and, and while they're at the cabin, they're like having a meal and they're like, you know, they might have a little alcohol. So they're like playing these weird like games and stuff. And there's a fire. And then there's like all of a sudden it's like, like the door. And you're like, what is that? And you're like, oh, okay, this is so corny. You know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm talking about? And it's always like the same kind of plot that plays out. It's like they're either about to die, they're, they're, somebody's chasing them, like there's another group of people who's playing with and they got masks on and you're like, what is this? You know, like every time I go to a cabin now, I'm like. <laughs> but there is always two types of people in this movie. You have this group of people that I would say is the majority. The majority. And you have this token person. We'll just call him a token person. But there's the majority. <laughs> and typically the way that the movie plays out <laughs> is that the majority likes to go towards the ghost and the, the, the one token person likes to run away from the ghost. Am I being honest? <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking, but you're probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking. I'm not the majority. <laughs> I'm the one that's running away from the ghost, yet most of y'all like to run towards the ghost. I don't get it. I don't get it. Why run towards the thing that you're most afraid of? You know what I mean? It's like, call 911. No, no, let's go get the bat and we can take care of it. And you're like, y'all tripping. Like, I'm see, like, see you later, right? That's always how the movie plays out. This is why I think Peter is careless and reckless because he is the majority. <laughs> He's like, let's go towards the ghost. It says that they were terrified. They were scared. And it says that they thought it was a ghost. And Peter's like, if it's you, tell me to come out. <laughs> He's like, it's me. Come. <laughs> He 
he didn't have complete clarity. And he also was about to do something that was actually impossible. Yet he was confident in the voice that he heard. He didn't need to know and see that it was Jesus. He just needed to hear the voice of Jesus to give him confidence. How, this is how we know this is an actually crazy story. It's because all it, it took Jesus to, to say is, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter says, not, hey, who is it? He says, Lord, it, if, it, if it is you, command me to come out. Not, hey, guy walking on water, hey, potential ghost. Hey, Lord, if it is you, call me, command me. Tell me to come out of the boat, to get out of my boat and begin to walk on water. This is crazy because why did the disciples stay in the boat, but Peter decided to get out? Because they all would have been able to recognize the voice of of Jesus. They had spent time with Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. They had just seen Jesus produce a miracle. Jesus is the one that told them to go to the other side. So they would have known the voice of Jesus. Yet some of them were worried, more worried about what they couldn't see, and Peter was worried way more what he heard, and that gave him the confidence to step out of a boat and begin to walk on water. You see, when you hold on to the word of Jesus, you don't care what else is happening. You don't need to figure out more clarity in your life. You don't need to figure out how more capable you need to make yourself. You don't need to think about anything else because you know the voice that is calling you is gives you and produces enough confidence for you in the first place. Yeah. It was the voice of Jesus that produced the most confidence in Peter to get him out of a boat and begin to get him to do something that was actually impossible. How many of you are waiting to do the thing that you want to do, the thing that you feel like you're not capable of doing, but you won't listen to the voice that's calling you to do it? He's given us his word. He says, come, that is enough. That is enough for you. I pray that tonight, by the end of tonight, that you stop worrying about seeking more clarity for your life. That you stop worrying about making yourself more capable. Can I just give you a little fact? You're not going to find it. You're not going to get more clarity and you're not going to become more capable by staying in the boat. You'll become more confident. You'll walk inside of what God is calling you to do and what he will produce in you and he will show you every step of the way. This is how you walk how you walk on water, one foot in front of the other as you gain more and more clarity because you listen to his voice and not try to think about how you can manipulate the situation. It was the voice of Jesus that gave Peter the confidence to get out of the boat and walk on water. Come, so Peter got out of the boat and walked on water. And he came to Jesus. I said this a little bit early, and this is why this story, I think, is so relatable. It's simply because Peter's walking on water. And the next text says that when he saw the wind, he was afraid. So he went from a confident stance to a really, really insecure stance. He went to being really, really bold, courageous, crazy, to a place of being just absolutely afraid. And you're like, oh, this is relatable because I know those moments in my life where I walked in confidence at one point. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I was good. Thursday, Friday came and I was like, I'm terrified again. I don't know what to do with my life again. Or maybe you were walking and you're like, man, I know exactly what God's calling me to do. I know exactly how to do it. I know exactly where I'm supposed to go. I know exactly who I'm supposed to talk to. I know exactly, and you have all the confidence in the world, and then you get there and you're like, but now I'm afraid, and you decide to shrink back. That's why this story is so relatable. It's because Peter represents all of us who've walked in confidence one day and then been terrified the next, who've walked in a season of confidence that God, oh, I know God's called me here. I know God's called me to preach here. I know God's called me to minister here. I know God's called me to Mosaic Youth here. But then the moment where I'm like, God, you tell me to come and I don't know what's next. I'm like, I don't know if you're good anymore. I don't know if I can trust you anymore. I don't know if I can. Do I really believe that you have my best in mind? I was confident for four and a half years. And now the last nine months got me feeling like I'm walking on shaky ground again. We oftentimes live our lives in the same way. Just be honest with yourself. You're more afraid than you are confident. 
And that's okay because this story is saying, hey, you can, you can relate to it. Here's what happens. So seeing the wind, he became afraid. This is interesting, though, because in the same way as I ain't never seen nobody walk on water, when's the last time you really, like, saw the wind? Like, I mean, like, you, like, saw the wind. Like, you know, like, those times in the summer in Texas where it's, like, you see heat waves? Have you ever saw, like, wind waves? <laughs> like, uh, have you? Like, I'm, like, asking, like, Jingle, I'm going to get, like, I haven't, so have you. <laughs> he saw the wind. There's two things I want to point out because the text is very, very, very detailed in this way. It says that this is happening at the fourth watch of the night, which means that it's about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. It's dark outside. How you see in the dark, which you cannot see in the light. How is it that Peter saw the wind in the middle of the night and that's what made him afraid? It's dark outside but yet he saw the wind. Here's another thought that I had, is that before we, the, the text even gives the details of what time it is, it says that they had already been beaten up by the waves for the wind was against them, which means that Peter already knew the wind existed because that means he would have felt it, he would have heard it because it was against them. So why all of a sudden is the wind the thing that has him most afraid. He's walking on water towards a ghost, but he's not afraid about that. He's afraid when he sees the wind. I don't know what seeing wind looks like to you, but I know what it feels like when the wind is so strong and it's so against you that it feels like it's slowing you down from going where you thought you and where you intended to go. Have you ever felt wind? When it just came and it just... Whew, just knocked you off almost? You ever heard the sound of wind? Because wind creates two things, movement and sound. We can go outside, and if it was windy, we typically would be able to tell why. Not because we can see it, but because we can see what the wind is doing to everything around it. It's moving the trees. It's moving flags. You hear it when you drive, and you're like, and you feel it. Wind creates movement. How did the waves move and beat up the boat? Because the wind was moving the waves. Other thought is that wind makes a sound. Have you ever heard like the whistle of the wind? You know what I mean? Where it just sounds like a, like a whistle and you're like, ooh, that was loud, right? I'm curious if it wasn't that Peter saw the wind, but maybe he just felt it strong enough or he just heard it loud enough that that's what robbed him of his confidence. You see, the wind is natural. He's not in control of it. He's not control, in control of the wind. Neither are you. The moment we walk out of this building, and if it's windy, we can't stop it from being windy. If we're going to be people who walk on water, we have to hold on to the word in the wind. The reality is you know how to hold on. You've just been holding on to the wrong word. You've been holding on to the past. You've been holding on to, to what you thought was going to come, what you thought life should look like. You've been holding on to the things that people said about you when you were young, what your parents and those young people, what your parents expected you to do, you've been holding on to that, and so you can't break free from it. Parents, you've been holding on to failure, <laughs> that you thought you would have more success at this point, that you would be further along, that your house, your life, your, your income, everything would look different. You've been holding on to it, so you know how to hold on. But the wind has been coming, and it's been at your back, and it's been in front of your face, and you're holding on to that thing. And I'm here to just tell you, you know how to hold on. Stop holding on to the wrong word and begin to hold on to the word of God. Because it was the word that called Peter to walk out on the, and get out of the boat and walk in confidence in the first place. The wind was there. The wind was against Peter before he ever got out the boat. So the wind is against you always. It will always forever be there in your life. You will always have to deal with wind. The difference between you walking in the wind and walking on water is the way that you hold on to what word. Whatever word you hold on to will determine how you stand. 
Whatever word you hold on to will determine the perspective that you see your own self in. Whatever word that you hold on to will actually begin to reveal the eyes of what you believe about the Savior and the one that you're walking towards. Yeah. And let me even say it like this, that the word that you hold on to will actually determine what wind you let get in front of you. See, because the wind can be against you and you still hold on to the word and you feel a wind at your back. There's two types of wind. Ones that stop you from moving to the place you intended to go and ones that get you actually faster to the places that you're supposed to be. The Holy Spirit said he moves like the wind. So there's a wind at your back, but there's also a wind in front of you and it says that it was against you. Stop being surprised when the wind is in front of you. It's supposed to do that. It's natural. But start holding on to the word, and I promise you, your life will begin to look like it's not on shaky ground. It's actually on solid ground, even though you're standing on water. The way that you hold on to the word will determine how you stand on the water. Peter holds on to the word, come. That's it. That's all it took for him. Jesus says, come, and he's like, I'm here. But what do we know about this story? Because it's relatable. This is what I want to close with as, as the worship team comes back up. It says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. So what we know is that he stepped out in confidence, but he didn't continue to walk in confidence. But instead, he let the wind cause him to be afraid. Therefore, he began to sink. We all have a boat. We all have to learn how to hold on. But we all, knows, we all know what it feels like to sink. Have you ever felt like you've been sinking? Have you ever felt like life has just been drowning you? And most of you, I, we won't do it, the statistic of the room. You probably all can swim. We're going to say that. You all can swim. So sinking is not necessarily a bad thing if you can swim, right? But we all know what it feels like to sink. Look what happens when Peter sinks. He saw it and he began to sink and he cried out. Can I just encourage you that when you begin to sink, you're in the best position to cry out to God. When you feel like you're sinking, you're actually in position to be saved. You see, the thing about this is that Peter couldn't have been at a distance towards Jesus. He had to be close to Jesus. So he could have been walking in part of the story, but eventually he had been standing in front of Jesus. But he began to sink. And here's what he says. When he cried out, Lord, save me, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? There's this story that it brings back to mind. I was about 10 years old. And my sister was about six. And you know those times where you're like in the pool and like she's like, she's on my back. And so she's like, let's see how far we can go with like keeping our heads above water. So I got her. She, she got like, you know, like a head length of, uh, over me. And so we're hanging out and we're just like walking and I'm like tippy toeing. And you know, like those pools that are like three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet. It wasn't one of those pools. It was like three feet, four feet, six feet. And so like, I like, like slip. I would have thought my sister would have let go because she also was now under the water, but she decided to hold on real tight. We both begin to sink. You know what I realized in this story? Is that when I begin to sink, the first thing that I do is I begin to reach. That when you begin to sink, your natural movement is to reach your hands up under the water. That's the natural movement that you would do. You would begin to try to get yourself back up to the top. You're a natural sinker, which means you're a natural reacher. Peter was sinking, yet he also was reaching. So my third point is sinking requires reaching. That it's okay when you get out of the boat 
and you begin to walk in confidence and then that moment comes where you're like, I'm terrified again and you begin to feel like life is sinking. It's okay because Jesus is actually in a better position to save you than anyway because you're sinking and you're actually in a better position to cry out towards him because you've been reaching up in the first place. This is a story about what it looks like to walk on water, but this is a story of what it feels like to walk with Jesus. You gotta get out of your boat. And I pray right now, whoever you are, release control. Release control. Number two is this. Don't just let any voice call you out the boat. <laughs> when the voice of Jesus says, come, go. Go because it's confidence. It's secure. It'll, it'll protect you. Let me even just say it like this. You'll begin to walk on water, which is not possible for you in your humanness. You'll, be do, you'll begin to do things that only God could do through you because you walked in a way that looked absolutely crazy. You're like, why call this crazy faith? Because it's crazy that Peter decided to do this. It's crazy that he, he listened to a word and that gave him enough confidence to walk on water. It's crazy that when he began to seek, Jesus was already there. Instead, immediately he reached out his hand to grab hold of him. You see, when you fail to hold on to the word, the word always holds on to you. Jesus is always ready to hold on to you. So I just want to encourage you. Get out the boat. Hold on to the word. It's okay if you sink. Just reach up. Just reach up. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you that you are a God that is not calling us to live a normal life. You're calling us to live a crazy life, to do crazy things. So I pray right now, God, that every person in this room, wherever they are, whatever part of the journey that they're in, God, I pray that this message would speak something into their step right now. God, for the person who has been trying to gain control over their life and it just feels like they just keep getting beaten, beaten up, I just pray that they would release control right now and they would actually say, my life is open to you to lead it, to guide it, Jesus, that I can't do this without you. And God, for the person in here who has stepped out they have stepped out and all they have been is hit. And it, the wind feels like it's against them. God, I can't pray the wind to go away, but I pray that they will learn how to hold on to your word. That they will learn how to hold on to the, that they will learn how to, to get themselves into your word. That we hear your word, God. For the person in the room who just feels like life is suffocating and it is sinking and they don't know what anything else to do when it feels like I'm drowning. God, I pray that they would realize that tonight is the best place they could be in, but tonight is the night where they just begin to reach up again. Thank you, Jesus, that you are a God who saves his people, that you are a present help in need. And God, there are people in this room who are in need, and I pray that they would begin to acknowledge it and they would reach out to the one who has enough to meet their needs. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you and we pray this in your name. I want to just end really quickly with this because the, the last part is really encouraging. So Jesus says, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. When Jesus and Peter got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. So some of you, you were not ready to get out of your boat and it's okay, it's okay. But some of you, the whole point of you getting out of your boat is not for you to walk on water. It's for you to experience Jesus in touch, such a way that when you get back into the boat with the people that you've been around, that they begin to worship Jesus. That it feels so crazy to them that they're like, I don't know what you just did. I saw the whole thing play out, but I'm so convinced that God is who he says he is because of what you decided to step out into. And so can I just encourage you, Mosaic Church, because this is my last time here. Step out, step out. You've been hit with wind. The wind has been against us since day one. Can I just be real for just a second? 
You know who I'm talking to. It's not going anywhere. The wind will always be there. It's your ability that determines how well you stand in the middle of the wind. Can I just encourage you with this? What you're doing is crazy, but I believe it's that crazy faith that makes people wanna follow a crazy Jesus like this. So can I just encourage you, live crazy faith. Go out and live a crazy life. Go back into the boats that you got out of and show people what it looks like to follow Jesus. Because people need it. People don't wanna live these lives that are like safe. I believe every human wants to live a life that is crazy. And I just tell you, when you put your faith in a crazy God, you live a crazy life. So I just wanna encourage you and I wanna bless you as a church. Father, this church is meant to do the crazy thing. This church is meant to go into the world and do crazy things. God, this church is supposed to take the crazy people in and make them not so crazy. God, this is supposed to be a place where people can come find and deal with their craziness, but walk out in even more craziness because it just looks like faith. So I pray right now for every single person in this room that God, people begin to look at their lives because they stepped out in such a crazy way that they're like, I wanna serve God the way that you do. I wanna go to church the way that you do. I wanna love Jesus the way that you do. I wanna do ministry the way that you do. God, why? Because we simply decided we're not gonna live these lives that look like staying in boats. We're gonna look like lives that feel like walking on water. So God bless them, God anoint them, God I love them. God, I'm so grateful for the journey that we have walked in the last few years, but God, I'm even more excited for what you're calling them, them into. God, we love you, we thank you, and this is all in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. My name is Kennedy Bancosh, and I was born here in Nacogdoches. I'm 17 years old, and I go to Woden High School. I would say that I grew up in a very Christian home, and I went to a small Baptist church most of my childhood. Up until I got into middle school is when my family and I stopped going because our preacher, who we loved, left. We then decided to hop around to different churches with family and friends, but none really filled the empty hole that was in our hearts. When we stopped going to church is when I stopped being consistent with spending my time with the Lord, and that led me to feel very insecure, lonely, and unhappy. Fast forward to the very beginning of this semester. I walked into a service here at Mosaic feeling embarrassed and afraid. When we began to worship, I saw everyone being very comfortable and proud as they experienced God's presence, and I began to feel jealous and ashamed. I immediately felt the urge to pray, so I did. I asked God for forgiveness, and I began to beg for any kind of help that He was willing to give me. In that exact moment, I felt the Holy Spirit completely fall on me in a way I've never felt before. That night, the Lord began to fill up an empty life abundantly, leaving me absolute no choice but to let it spill out. I then began to worship in a way I never believed I could. I knew right then and there that this was my turning point. The craziest part about it is when we all sat down and Jamal began to preach his sermon, which was titled, My Turning Point. And I then realized that this night I was gifted with freedom from the Lord. I now live my life being consistent and spending time with the Lord, and now I am no longer ashamed or alone. The Lord has blessed me by putting a person in my life that I wouldn't have ever imagined. Maylee Coleman is my youth leader and also a close friend. God has shown up through her to help me become the best person I can be, not only for myself, but also for the Lord. I want to start fresh, walking in my newfound freedom. Today, I am going public with my faith. Mason Prince. I am a sophomore at Central Heights and I didn't really grow up going to church as a kid. It wasn't until I got into middle school that I started going to church. I got invited by some friends and I thought my friends were going so it'd be fun for me too. I always felt like I could attend but I never really felt like I belonged. It was as easy at first for me to go because it was just for fun but something changed for me and I really wanted to learn more about Jesus and growing in my faith. There was a lot of times where I felt like everyone else was still going for fun and I wanted more. 
I found out about Crave, which was a thing where students from all over came and we worshiped and listened to a message from other students. I started to go to that and that's where I met Jamal and some other Mosaic youth leaders. Jamal invited me to come to one night and I was really excited. When I got there, everything about it was different than what I would have had experienced. I realized there was a way you could learn about Jesus and have fun while doing it. I started coming every Wednesday and I started to realize God was making a difference in my life from the inside out. As I learned more, I started believing more that God loves me and has sacrificed his son for my sins and that started meaning something more in my life. I now understand that I have a relationship with God where he wants to know me and guide me through life. A verse that has helped me a lot is Proverbs 3, 5, 6. Trust in the Lord and don't lean on your understanding. As I am learning to trust God in my life, I have done, all I have done is grow more and more. I believe baptism is the next step for me and an important step in my life. I want people to see what God has done in my life and that I am a new creation. I knew I wanted to get baptized and lately felt like God was calling me not to delay. When I found out Jamal was leaving, I knew I wanted him to do it because he is my biggest inspiration and role model. He has walked with me over the last year and has helped me see God's power in my life. Today I'm going public with my faith. Hi, my name is Savannah Yates. I was born and raised in Nacogdoches. I am currently in the seventh grade at Central Heights. I participate in volleyball, basketball, softball, track, and cheer. I enjoy fishing, hunting, spending time with friends and family, and attending Pine Cove in the summer. When I was six, my dad passed away. I always felt like I had to be strong, independent, and perfect for my mom and family and everyone around me. I wanted to always be in control and make decisions on my own. One summer when I was at Pine Cove, we were worshiping and I felt the Lord really call my heart to Him. At the end of the night, they asked us to stand if we wanted to be saved, but I was too scared at the time. When we got back to the cabin, I decided I wanted to talk to my camp counselor and she walked me through accepting Jesus into my heart. After being saved that night at camp, I began to understand that I didn't always have to be strong and that when I was weak, I could lean on the Lord. Allowing Jesus to be in control, of my life has been hard and still is, but when I'm unsure, I try my best to let him guide me to making the right decisions. Although I still make mistakes, I know that I am forgiven. I know there is grace for me. I know I'm not walking alone because Jesus is walking before and beside me. I was too scared then to stand up at camp, but now I am confident in who God says I am. I am proud to stand in front of you and show you what God has done in my life. Today, I am going public with my faith. Hello, my name is Dayton Yates and I'm a freshman here at SFA. I've grown up in Nacogdoches and I've been going to Mosaic for a little over a year. Growing up, I went to church on Sundays and I was involved in youth groups through middle school and I said yes to Jesus a couple of times that I can remember, but I never had an understanding of what a relationship with Jesus really looked like. In high school, I began to do my own thing. Although I knew my life was supposed to be more than partying girls in the typical high school journey, I was stuck chasing the temporary things. I was trying to be perfect, the perfect son, perfect student, perfect athlete. I was trying to be the best. Although I worked hard on these things, nothing I was doing was enough. At the beginning of 2020, before the pandemic, I got into some trouble involving alcohol. I had to go to an alternative school for six weeks. This felt like the worst thing to ever happen to me. I was at rock bottom. Thankfully, God moved in my life at that moment. I came to Mosaic on a Wednesday night on one of the worst days of my life. That night, I had a conversation with Jamal and decided to give my life to Jesus. I realized that the creator of the world wanted to, wanted to be in an intimate relationship with me. Just believing that made me want to pursue, pursue Jesus intentionally. Since then, my life has looked completely different. While 2020 was the hardest year of my life, 
it was also one of the best years. One of the things that God has shown me through our relationship is how to love people. I'm capable of loving people because he loved me first. I've been blessed in so many ways just because I said yes to Jesus and built a relationship that is life-giving. I asked Jamal to baptize me today because God has used him to impact my life in so many ways. And I would not be sitting in this water if it were not for him. I know this step is right for me because I wanted people to see what Jesus has done for me. Today, I'm going public with my faith.